All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you would take your seats, please, so we can resume. Thank you very much. All right, ladies and gentlemen, if you would take your seats, please, so we can resume. Thank you very much. Yes, may I have, it, have your attention, please? May I have your attention, please? We'll now begin um, the rest of our uh, opening statements. Uh, and uh, we begin with um, the Honorable Billy Miller, who is, as I said earlier, the Deputy Prime Minister and Foreign Minister of uh, Barbados. Ms. Miller. Thank you. In the Parliament of Barbados, I represent the city of Bridgetown, which is one of the oldest cities in the Americas, 368 years old, is a long time in the Americas, and it's also one of the smallest, a population of just over a quarter of a million. Yet Bridgetown is a microcosm of all that ails cities across the world and of all that makes them repositories of human civilization. I think that Bridgetown is wonderfully illustrative of human solidarity in the way that it has responded to the needs of its several publics over the centuries and still is. Its beginnings as a city were inauspicious. Richard Ligon, the author of the first history of Barbados, observed very caustically, I think, in, 19, in 1647, he said, and I quote him, upon the most inward part of the bay stands the town, which is called the bridge, for that a long bridge was made at first over a little nook of the sea, which was rather a bog than a sea. A town ill situate, for if they had considered health as they did convenience, they would never have set it there. But one house being set up, another was erected, and so a third and a fourth, till at last it came to take the name of a town. Despite Ligon's purest and accurate criticisms of its physical defects, Bridgetown has survived and flourished as a capital city. Makes one wonder what makes cities work. Two clues are to be found in his own strictures, the notion of convenience and the fact of random growth. Random growth is anathema to many planners since it seemingly gives too much leeway to human whim and contrariness. But people with all their glorious imperfections are the soul of cities. Haphazard human settlements have always been and will continue to be a vital component of Bridgetown, which was never a formally laid out city, but a patchwork of villages radiating out from that primeval swamp at its center, much like London. But that swamp has long since been turned into a beautiful inner harbor and careenage. Convenience, therefore, to its inhabitants is another criterion of successful cities. The first settlers in Barbados chose the site for their town despite the swampy terrain because it was the mouth of the only partially navigable river in the main bay of the island and therefore eminently convenient for shipping and commerce. Presumably the Amerindians before them had chosen it for much the same reasons. It was they who had built the original bridge from which the city derives its name. In fact, it has remained up to this day the hub of commercial activity, servicing, as it has in the past, many sectors of the economy, sugar, tourism, and more recently, financial services. Of course, within the town, centers of activity have shifted over the years, leading some areas to decline and others to flourish. One thing is certain, cities that cease to reflect the convenience of the people who work and live in them will die. Another reason why cities endure is their diversity. Diversity of people and diversity of use. We have seen in Barbados many different forms of human settlement since it was the first landfall in the New World. Europeans, Africans, Jews, Indians formed settlements there. Historical monuments to these settlements still exist. Bridgetown is the site of the oldest parliament in the Americas, the second oldest synagogue in the hemisphere, recently marvelously restored. 
It also accommodated all classes of society, from the wealthy merchant to the poor laborer. Slums and fashionable districts coexisted, and this continues to be part of the vitality and the robust interaction of this particular city, as it is, I believe, in most. It has also been the center of all significant political and social events in the island. Indeed, the history of Bridgetown is at one and the same time a history of Barbados. It has always been the seat of government and the center of popular protests, both intellectual and physical, against oppressive and unrepresentative rule. The National Rebellion in 1937 against an unjust and repressive colonial order colonial began and played itself out in Bridgetown. Modern political parties and the labor movement began there. It truly epitomizes the political and economic stability that the present generation has inherited. It has always been relevant to the needs and the aspirations of its people. Today, like so many cities across the world, it has its troubles. But we plan, again, to make it a live-in city, to restore vigor and confidence and a sense of dynamism, creating public spaces which are traffic-free, not only for inter environmental reasons, but for social region reasons, enabling squares and public gardens to be returned to their historic function of places to see and be seen and where the unexpected social encounter is encouraged preserving and restoring the unique Barbadian architectural and historical heritage which graces our town, greening the city and stimulating the return of residents from across the social spectrum. At the core of this process will be a massive waterfront redevelopment plan centered on the inner basin of the harbor with its defining bridges. But the physical redevelopment will not save Bridgetown if at the same time we do not restore community as the urban form of human solidarity. It is in cities that the challenges of the 21st century will be at their most intense and change at its greatest. Everywhere, cities are showing social, economic, and environmental problems at their most acute. The solutions will not be found merely in new physical development, but in how cities will manage issues of capacity and congestion, and how they will marry the opportunities of global technologies with local needs, and how they will enable people to live in community. Cities must be areas of shared values which generate community pride and social equality. Despite the enormity of the challenge, I remain an optimist for the future of cities, not for economic reasons only, though without successful business activity, few silly cities will remain vibrant. Not for environmental reasons only, though sustainable development through low energy use, efficient waste management, and low pollution will become critical aspects of urban management, and certainly not for technological reasons only. But because humans are social beings who require shared intercourse, shared discourse, shared work, shared pastimes, and a marketplace for ideas, fashion display, and social celebration, I'm skeptical that an electronic environment will ever replace the physical site of a city as a unique place in which people desire to conduct these activities. It is in meeting these overarching social needs from which other functions in economy, information, education, culture, and governance will flow that I would view the sustainable city of the new millennium. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you very much, uh, Mrs. Miller. And now, Dr. Federico Mayor. Dear citizens, uh, UNESCO has as a mission to build peace in the minds of men through education, science, and culture. To build peace, to build democracy, and to provide this endogenous development that is the basis for a sustainable peace. And in our constitution, that was made immediately after a terrible war, a war with genocide, a war in which all the perversities of the bellic, of the conflagration were present, it was said that economic growth is indispensable, but not enough. That political development was necessary, but not enough. And it is added textually in our constitution that welfare depends on the intellectual and moral solidarity of mankind. It's for this that I am happy that this moral and intellectual solidarity is, in my view, what human solidarity means. And 
must be applied, first of all, to prevent war. Because war is the, the only frame in which no justice, no education, no housing, all what we are considering here as rights in all these UN conferences will not exist if we have war. Prevention, prevention is, in my view, the supreme expression of solidarity. We must prevent. We must be able to anticipate. We must be able to be in a watchtower. And this capacity of anticipation is, in my view, one of the most important distinctive capacities of the human beings. And to prevent, we must know. And once we know we have a diagnosis, we must have a treatment. But once we have a treatment, we must apply the treatment timely. Because if we postpone the application of the treatment, irreversible conditions can arise. And this, for me, as a former brain biochemist, is very important. We are postponing many treatments for many diagnoses that we have already done. And this, this is the problem that we have in environmental issues, in social issues, in educational issues. We can arrive at moments in which the situation will be irreversible. Irreversibility is therefore for me a very important criteria of human solidarity because this can define what I like to say ethics of time. Education, education, this kind of empowerment of the people in order to narrow these immense asymmetries that we have today. Asymmetries in the sharing of knowledge, asymmetries in the sharing of wealth. 20% of the humans have 80% of the resources in the planet. This is the root for so many conflicts. And also we must recognize that the males, we have 96% of all the decision maker official possibilities in the planet. This means that we decide 96% of the time. We have an enormous gender asymmetry. Only 10% maximum of women occupy today post in the parliaments in the world. Here again, the voice of the planet is 50 and 50, and we have 90% only of male voice. Therefore, all these things can be corrected through education for all throughout life. As you know, and this is one expression, practical expression of human solidarity, UNESCO, UNDP, UNFPA, UNICEF, the World Bank, all together with non-governmental organizations, all together with all the governments of the world, we decided in 1990 that education must be for all. Only with this we can address the problems of overpopulation, of massive emigration, of environmental degradation. And this education for all must not be only formal education, must be this learning without frontiers that is so important, frontiers, geographical frontiers, cultural frontiers, linguistical frontiers, religious frontiers, gender frontiers, all this must be overcome. And I am very happy what was already been said before me by some of the speakers concerning the fantastic possibilities that we have today through communication. But we must be, of course, in the super highways. But one facet of solidarity is to be also in the subways of communication. We have today 600,000 human settlements in the world without electricity. How they can, all these people living there, particularly women that are by far the most discriminated, how we can provide to them the benefits of this interaction that all this network represents, we must apply the last technology, particularly the technology related with solar panels or biomass production of electricity. We must take into account this excluded in order that solidarity could be represented by including the excluded and reaching the unreached today. Only in the extent that we can narrow these asymmetries, we can apply this moral and intellectual solidarity of mankind. Human solidarity means to take into account and learn 
from the minorities and learn from those that represent this fantastic cultural diversity that is our wealth throughout the world and at the same time this link of all this diversity that represents what in the UNESCO's constitution is enshrined as being the democratic principles, not models. We must not impose the Western model of democracy, the principles of democracy that are freedom, freedom of expression is the first one, justice, equality, and solidarity. Solidarity is therefore, and I am very glad, my dear moderator, dear citizens, to tell you that solidarity is one of these four democratic principles that the founders of UNESCO thought that is absolutely indispensable to be a link among all this fantastic diversity of cultures and religions and beliefs and the styles of life that is our planet. Human solidarity means to honor our commitments to the world through international cooperation particularly being active members and honoring also our contributions to the international cooperation institutions, particularly the United Nations system. Human solidarity is to follow up the results of conferences like that one, because it's very important that now we are discussing and we are achieving very important goals, but the follow up. This is an expression of human solidarity. In what extent now we will be able to follow up the results of Habitat 2? And finally, in my view, I would like to tell you that as a Catalan that I am, what really matters is not the past, is always the future. Because what heritage we have? We have a ethical heritage, very important, a physical heritage, we have monuments, we have a stone, very important things, we have a non-physical heritage, we have a genetic heritage, we have a lot of important heritage. But all this heritage has already been shared not very rightly in the past. We have still a heritage that is intact, that is our future. The way in which we will be able to better share our future is, in my view, the best expression of human solidarity. Thank you. Thank you very much. Thank you very much. And now Dean Morton, please. When human civilizations were first formed, the human longings for meaning beyond simple survival these longings were keyed to the seasons, to the cosmological cycles of the year, the stages of human maturation, and all of these with a unity of place and language and race. And out of these constants were developed a set of shared mores, with religious rituals serving as the glue that bound things together. This early universal experience of the world that was interpreted and participated in through rites and customs formed the universal memories of mankind. Now it goes without saying that this world of a unified culture has fragmented and dissolved forever so that the need and the challenge for our generation and future generations is to redefine and transform our modern world of separation and instability into a new kind of human solidarity, which does two things. It respects diversity and mobility, but it also builds on the fundamental commonalities in human memory. And what must be done is to bind humankind together with all of its deepest inherited emotional and psychological and spiritual instincts 
through some kind of new institution that is both interfaith, intercultural, political, spiritual, and physical, a new kind of crossroads. What's needed is an interfaith center in every city of the globe. These new centers will not be bureaucratic institutions, with all due respects, they will not be many United Nations or many World Councils of Churches, but rather something that's analogous to the ancient Acropolis, a classical unity in one place of temple, stadium, marketplace, and theater, where today's diversity of national and ethnic customs and religious traditions can be celebrated and upheld for the enrichment of everybody. These interfaith centers will be founded upon a very conscious use of two of the most ancient modes of communication. The first is through the arts, those common denominators of the emotions of brain and heart and gizzard. These are experiences that humankind knows and understands. How to use the power of theater, of dance, of sculpture, of architecture, of music and film in all their multiple combinations in celebration and entertainment halinde kullanıldığı and zaman hem eğitim amacıyla hem de insanları e, insanları eğlendirmek amacıyla kullanılabilir. Sanat insan part of contemporary development. And the second essential mode of communication in human society is ritual. İkinci Those experiences which distinguish and unite people in community and in governance and in the benchmarks of life's passage. These forms and practices are as old as the species itself and are found in every culture to lift up the seasons, the solstices and the equinoxes, the planting and the harvesting, the holidays and the holy days, and the national and family paradigms. All religions and all politics express their beliefs and platforms through ceremonial forms. Politicians and priests of every stripe all know how to have the people march and sing and salute and dance. The new interfaith centers will honor the rituals of every land and tribe, of every religion and faith tradition. Islam, Sunni and Shiite and Sufi, Hindu, Sikh, Jain, Christian, all of the brands, Armenians and Syrians and Roman Catholics and African Methodists, all of the Jews, Orthodox and Reform, all of the Buddhists, all of the Shintos and Taoists and Confucians, and most important, the indigenous faiths of every continent. We know how to do wonderful works of theater incorporating these great traditions. Think of Peter Brooks, Mahabharata, John Michael Tebelak's Godspell. Think of the traditions of Kabuki and No, of processions and circuses, of manifold voices and lands. The richness of our diverse heritages in art and ritual are sources of enchantment and challenge, touching at the roots of all culture and providing fertile ground for new growth. Interfaith centers, new acropolises, will tap the well of both common and diverse experience and provide the opportunity for sacred expression that is so necessary to bind the peoples of the planet into a viable, meaningful, and sustainable human solidarity. Thank you.
Thank you very much, Dean Morton. And now we have the mayor of Accra, Nat Nuno Amatefeo. Thank you very much, uh, Mr. McNeil. I recently read a book called The Distant Mirror, which described Europe in the 14th century. It's a period of European history which is characteristically called the Dark Ages because it was a time when European civilization was breaking up and new forms were emerging. The ancient Roman Empire was breaking into nation states like France, England, Germany, and uh, new forms of learning were emerging, new universities were emerging, and new old rules were all breaking apart. It was a time of great stress. It was a time of great transition. There were wars all over the continent as dynasties rose and fell, and there were numerous plagues. The bubonic plague made its first appearance at that time. It was all in all a very depressing time to be alive. But as the author pointed out, it was precisely in this moment of extraordinary change that new ideas arose. Many ideas that we now take for granted, the rights of the individual, the freedom to self-expression, the rights to new religious expressions, all started germinating at that period. When you're in the middle of it, it's very difficult to see what's going on. But after it's over, years later, you can look back and say, it was precisely at this time that this idea started. I am mayor of a city in one of the most turbulent areas in the world right now. As I sit here, we have two full-scale civil wars raging. We have one or two imminently about to break out. We have plagues in the form of AIDS and other diseases raging in the continent. We have people moving from one area to the other and huge exodus of refugees, men and women and children going across. We have new phenomena of child warriors who are being used by rebel armies to create all kind of havoc. Institutions are breaking down. The ancient colonial empires, which provided glue at one time, are all dissolving. We are now having to look at ourselves and say, where are we going? What kind of human solidarity can we create? 30 years ago, when Ghana gained its independence, politics was very simple. It was us against them. 30 years later, after three or four coup d'etats, after a couple of heads of state executed, after all kinds of social disturbances, we are becoming wiser. We are realizing that it's no longer us against them. 45% of the population in my country is under 15 years old. Their experience of civic rule, their experience of history is all what is homegrown. It has no relevance to what's happened outside. And now they are looking to us. We are now having to redefine what we mean by a nation. The very idea of a nation in Africa is under stress. When the Europeans carved out African nations 100, 200 years ago, they simply took their own interests into consideration. So they cut through tribes. They cut through whole communities. In Ghana, you have Everest on one side. In Ghana, you have Everest in Togo. There was no relevance to the geographical homogeneity. Now, with all the stresses in politics, these things are under threat. The question is, in 50 years' time, what kind of nations would we see in Africa? How will we get there? On one hand, you have a case like in Burundi, where people have refused to talk to one another, and the result is bloodshed like you would never imagine. You have Liberia, where people have refused to talk to one another. We are learning in my own country that with all this evidence before us, one cannot refuse to recognize the signs that if you are going to create a nation, it must be based on ideas which have integrity. It must be based on belief in people's ability to govern themselves. I reminded a couple of uh, months ago, my city administration, the civil service, grew so tired of not inadequate pay, they decided to go on strike. So for three or four days, the city administration was quietly shut down. Three days later, they came back because they had realized that people were getting used to the dangerous idea they could do without government. Um, um, <laughs> and it was, 
<laughs> Indeed, it was an idea we could not encourage since most of our salaries depended upon it. <laughs> but these are the things that we are now facing in Africa. What is government? How is the relationship between the government and the governors? Once upon a time, we as the governors made the rules and we imposed it. Now we realize that if the rules are going to be obeyed by a people who are so diverse, we must start talking to them. Recently, just before I left, a boatload of Liberian refugees disembarked on our shores. You must have read about it because these were refugees that left Monrovia and for many, many days they were on the high seas, the boat was leaking, it was about to sink, no country wanted them. Obviously, refugees from war-torn countries means possible destabilization. You're getting young men who've just come from areas where people are getting killed and who are used to it. If you bring them to your own country, you run the risk that they may destabilize your own. Our president was asked what to do about it, and after a lot of back and forth, he finally agreed to let them into my country. I went to my mother and said, Mom, look, I'm going to get all these refugees in this country, and they will invariably end up in Accra. And she said, well, son, just look at it this way. In a couple of months, you have wonderful Liberian uh, restaurants in this city. And <laughs> which is a way of enriching our city culture. You have to, we have to open up. Africa is learning and learning very, very fast that the ideals that we held 40 years ago, that we were a continent that was going to make a difference, and a continent that had an instinctive right to human respect, can be tested and tested very, very roughly. When Europeans were having their wars, we could sit back and say, look at them, they are bloodthirsty. Now it's our own turn, and do we succeed, do we fail, depends very much on how we are willing to respect each other. We are looking into our traditions. When the Europeans were there, they used the chiefs in a particular way. When we got independence, a lot of chiefs were seen as having allied themselves to the Europeans, so they were marginalized out of contemporary politics. We are now realizing that a people without a memory are people without a future. So these are the repositories of our memories. We are going back to them, and we are now including them in our rule. There were several statements made about women in politics. When we started our independence movement, a lot of the men, the African men, could not get very much involved because they didn't have the capital. The people who controlled most of the commercial capital apart from the European powers, the people who control most of the commercial capital in the country were the women because in a polygamous society, women went out to work in order to take care of their own branch of the family. Most of our political leaders were funded by women. As soon as they got into power, they promptly forgot their debt to these women and marginalized them out of power. <laughs> now. Three or four coup d'etats later, we have learned to include women in <laughs> our parliaments. <laughs> so now our uh, the, we're having elections in December, and the rule is that 40% of all the parliamentarians have to be women. Right. Mr. Mayor. Well, I'm not quite sure whether in a couple of years time you'll be applauding this decision. <laughs> I, uh, but nevertheless, it's nice to hear you approve of it. So uh, this, we are living in a time of tremendous change, and we are designing things as we go along. But we never want to forget that we are Africans. We have a culture, we have a genius, and as much as possible, we have to look to it. We reach our hands across the continent to our brothers and sisters, and we say that join us in creating a new continent, in creating a new future, based on the things that we have held dear. Obviously, in the time of internet, in the time of rapid communication, you cannot hold on to setting practices. Well, I've just been told that I cannot hold on to this speech much longer. <laughs> And uh, I'm getting used to this kind of whole thing. Uh, uh, sitting between Dean Morton and uh, Atos Schlesinger, I feel I'm as close to God as you can ever get. <laughs> so anyway, uh, I want to stop here. And I suppose in the, uh, during the interactions, I'll get a chance to be a little more verbose. Thank you. Thank you. <laughs> Thank you. <Good> <laughs> So, 
Thank you. Uh, thank you very much. Uh, of course, it isn't only in your country that people are asking what is government and what is it for. It's happening after 200 years in the United States right now. But um, um, thank you for your cooperation. I'd like to try and finish these opening statements before we break for lunch. So uh, Arthur Schlesinger, please. Habitat 2 is concerned with the emergence of the city as the dominating unit of civilization. Cities have long been vital centers of work and trade, of government and culture, but through most of the world's history, they have been appendages of rural living. Today, we are now confronted by the probability that soon, for the first time in history, more people will be living in cities than on the countryside, and that cities will be larger than ever before. We face the age of the mega city, and the humanization of the mega city will be a basic challenge of the 21st century. We are familiar with the ills the mega city brings with it, the gross economic disparities, the ethnic, racial, religious, and class antagonisms, the vulnerability to disease, to crime, to corruption, the degradation of the environment, the lack of elemental services, and of the resources to provide them. Our panel today is asked to consider the role of human solidarity in meeting the problems of our urbanized future. Human solidarity is a troubling term embodying a hopeful but difficult concept. Concept is difficult because one striking feature of humankind is our infinite diversity, the dazzling multiplicity of cultures, traditions, languages, rituals, religions, customs, institutions, values, folkways, cuisines. Nor is multiplicity bad. What a, a dismal world it would be if we were all alike in thought and behavior. Our very diversity is the source of much of the richness and excitement of human existence. Underneath diversity, however, lie certain common human interests, and therein is the hopeful side of the invocation of human solidarity. To humanize the megacity, we must find means of, of promoting and institutionalizing the social trust that enables people of divergent thoughts and habits to live equitably together. The megacities must build civil societies if they are to cope with the problems that threaten to engulf them. A great obstacle to the development of civil society is the disparity of income and opportunity that so often accompanies the megacity. An imbalance between rich and poor, Plutarch said, is the oldest and most fatal ailment of all republics. Social trust depends on the availability of decent employment and decent compensation for the insulted and the dispossessed, as well as for the rich and powerful. But cities today are rarely self-sufficient, and employment may depend on macroeconomic macro decisions made beyond city limits. Social trust depends on self-respect, and a good job is the best guarantee of self-respect. It depends, too, on respect for others and on respect for law. Corruption is, heaven knows, an affliction of the developed world, but it is the curse of the developing world. I know that one culture's corruption may be another culture's way of doing business, that in certain cases bribery may even be a spur to economic development. Nonetheless, corruption systematically undermines social trust, and it is incompatible with the requirements of modernization, of, mo of modernity and of democracy. We will never redeem the megacity, to take one example, unless its inhabitants can be relied upon to pay their taxes. As the Minister of Justice in Taiwan recently put it, if we don't clean up our society, we cannot say we are a truly democratic society in which the rule of law is respected. Social trust depends, above all, on the creation of political institutions and mechanisms that facilitate self-government. Legal theorists speak today of the emerging norm of democratic entitlement. In 1991, the UN General Assembly declared that the right of everyone to take part in the government of his or her country is a crucial factor in the effective enjoyment by all of a wide range of other 
human rights and fundamental freedoms. Democratization, Secretary General Boutros Ghali said in, in 1993, democratization is a thread which runs through all the work of the UN. With participation, social and economic development become meaningful. With freedom of speech and of thought, civil institutions become durable. This entitlement to democratic government is a necessary precondition to the humanization of the megacity and the great virtue of democ because the great virtue of democracy is its capacity for self-correction. One further point, well made by Dr. Endow and other addresses at this conference, it is evident that the megacity is increasingly a feature of the developing world and decreasingly a feature of the developed world. Why should this be? Through history, the city has found new forms as it has adapted to the technologies of changing times. As Dr. Endow has emphasized, the developed world today is undergoing a structural change as profound as the Industrial Revolution two centuries ago. That was a shift from a farm-based to a factory-based economy. Shift today is from a factory-based to a computer-based economy. As the factory concentrated population in the city, so the computer promises to be an instrument for decentralization away from the city. People sitting in front of a keyboard in their own homes can now reach across the planet. The, the, com the computer and the microchip are transforming work and life in the developed world in time, they will reshape the city in the developing world. The megacity will not be with us forever. But in the meantime, we must address the present reality, people flowing into cities, swamping facilities for employment, energy, housing, health, education, transportation, increasingly succumbing to frustration, discontent, and despair, increasingly disrupting and destabilizing the world around them. We have much to do in the way of remedial measures before we reach the promised land. We must move on from pious exhortation to practical reform, and the first necessity, as it seems to me, is jobs. Thank you. Dr. Uh, Sarah Galdin. Thank you. I'd like to really pick up where Federico Mayor left off because he talked about the 20% of the world's population that in fact have 83% of the world's income. It is not just that monstrous inequity is in place, but it is in fact that this inequity has been growing over time. The top 20% was 30 times as rich as the poorest 20% 30 years ago. They are now 60 times as rich, 60 times as rich. The bottom 20% live off 1.4% of the world's income. The bottom 10% live off less than 0.5, less than half of 1% of the world's income. And that top 20% that controls 83% of the world's income refuses to give 0.3 of 1% in official development assistance. <laughs> Friends, it is a strange time we live in. Tremendous scientific achievements, dazzling technological breakthroughs, a world of plenty, and yet, and yet conditions of such misery and poverty that they make a mockery of the Universal Declaration of Human Rights and they add a denial of our common humanity. 40,000 people die of hunger-related causes every day. 700 million people go hungry every day. A billion people have no access to water, 1.7 billion have no access to sanitation. We have 1 billion people who live on less than a dollar a day. And if you just increase that figure to $2 a day, you have 3 billion people on the planet who live on less than $2 a day. It is more than ever a time to assert our common humanity and demand a united front of the caring because the conditions of absolute poverty we are talking about are beneath any definition of human decency. Now this is the backdrop against which the double transformation that has been talked about is taking place. The population explosion, the growth that's going to take place over the planet, two billion people within the next generation certainly on the planet and the third billion coming after that, 
95% of that will go into the developing countries. 90% of that increment will be in the cities of the developing countries. This is the backdrop that we have to deal with. And it's not just that, to put it in more concrete terms, in India alone, the increment to cities such as Bombay, Calcutta, Madras, and so on, in one generation will be more than double the present population of France, Germany, and the UK combined. So this challenge that we're trying to meet, this challenge is there, but it is also a challenge that we have to look at something else that is happening. This transformation on the information-based society that Dr. Schlesinger talked about is a reality. And it brings with it enormous promises. But it also has very troubling realities. It brings an increasing inequity. The gap between computer programmers and carpenters is growing. But more importantly, the gap between the best and worst computer programmer is infinitely larger than the gap between the best and worst carpenter. So that there is built into this mechanism of transformation a spreading of inequity, which is incidentally sustained by statistics within every nation as well as between nations over the past 15 years. What this requires, therefore, is that we take a proactive attitude not to try to stop that, not to try to stop the urbanization, but take a proactive attitude to ensure that those who are unreached are reached, those who are excluded get included, that we make a more proactive way to empower and enable people to build their better societies. We know the technical answers, whether it be water and sanitation, municipal finance, environmental health, microcredit, partnerships, public and private, national and local, all of that has been discussed. But what we're dis discussing here is more than that. It is about the cities that have a sense of identity, the bonds of solidarity, the assertion of our common humanity, the celebration of our diversity. All of that is about values and ideas, about what Ben Ladner called a compelling image of the humane city. And this, therefore, this image is what we need to create in our own minds to inspire us to act, for we are, right this instant, creating the future in the crucible of our minds. We owe it to the next generation that it be a humane future. For that next generation, we are the stewards of the earth. And we must recognize that there is a tide of pollution that is impacting our ecosystem and a tide of people that will not be denied. But there's also a tide of awareness that business as usual is unacceptable. Yes, Mr. Chairman, there is a tide in the affairs of men which taken at the flood leads on to fortune. Omitted all the voyage of their lives is bound in shallows and in miseries. On such a full sea are we now afloat, and we must take the current when it serves or lose our ventures. Thank you very much. Uh, Mr. Uh, Rajesh Tandon. Thank you. When I began to reflect a little bit about the theme for today's conversation, I was um, first reminded of my own uh, childhood in a medium-sized urban center in India. And I started recollecting um, in that early period of my childhood things that I enjoyed doing. I remember playing together with children of that neighborhood. I remembered visiting with my grandmother <coughs> other households on occasions of childbirth, marriage, and death. I remembered uh, celebrations in the neighborhood of um, festivals, of uh, religious occasions, I remembered an occasion when um, some families from that neighborhood left. That was the period of uh, early partition. I also remembered some new families which arrived in the neighborhood. And we spent time trying to help them to know who else lived in that neighborhood. In that uh, recollection, I realized that these were some of the elements of what I would call solidarity in a neighborhood. 
irrespective of the size of urban settlement, it is in the context of a reasonable neighborhood. It is in the context of relationships across families in a cultural, physical space that bonds of understanding, bonds of mutuality, sharing and caring are developed and strengthened. And for me, therefore, the question of human solidarity in today's rather rapidly changing world, as many speakers have pointed out, is to discover ways by which I could be with my grandmother again in the same type of neighborhood. I since moved to a large metropolitan, I am now living in Delhi. And in the last 20 years, I have changed four residences. I am living in four different neighborhoods. And in each successive time, I know fewer and fewer of my neighbors. I now live in a neighborhood where I only know the names of two families, let alone their background, let alone their aspirations. For festivals, we leave our neighborhood to be away somewhere else. And for rites of passages in the lives of other families of our neighborhood, we shy away from participating. If that has happened to me, I am wondering how I can regain my own sense of sharing and caring in the context of a changing, rapidly changing urban settlement that we have heard about. So for me, the question of solidarity in the urban setting is essentially starting from knowing who your neighbors are and learning to share with them in ways that are part of your life and not outside your life. Not structured or formalized or pushed around sharing, but a living experience with your neighbors. In recalling this, I am convinced that neighborhoods don't get developed. Neighborhoods get created. Neighborhoods require active intervention of grandmothers like the one I had and those of my neighbors. They require the playground of young children as the one I had, but my own children don't have in the new neighborhood where I live. Increasingly, therefore, the question of security of neighborhood, morality of neighborhood, the values in that neighborhood, the trust and support to each other in that neighborhood are some of the emerging elements of solidarity in the urban settlement that I live in and work in. I was uh, reminded of another story which uh, I read when I was spending a week in a conference in a great urban country called Singapore in our region in Asia Pacific. And I read a very interesting story which was a statement of the Minister for Social Welfare. And he said, we have built the best luxury hotel called Singapore. We have all the facilities, running hot and cold water, air conditioning, excellent elevators, comfortable rooms, communication technology, everything is here. But can Singapore be more than just a five-star luxury hotel? How can it become a society? How can it become a community? And in his speech, therefore, he was talking about the importance of building civil society, neighborhood associations, community groups. And for me, coming from India and reading that in a newspaper in Singapore was quite telling because my image of Singapore was quite different. So even those who have become five-star luxury hotels like Singapore are yearning for a neighborhood. And that, to me, is the essence of human solidarity. Lastly, I want to talk about human solidarity beyond face-to-face. -face. As a human being, I show solidarity to my 
kith and kin, to my family, to my extended family, to my joint family, even to my distant relatives, my tribe women and men. But in today's time, can I show solidarity to those whom I don't know? Can I show the same level of trust and care in those waves of immigrants which visit my city? But immigration has been the source of all cities. Look at Istanbul today. The rich history of several centuries of this city where we are talking about human solidarity is the history of accepting immigrants, accepting visitors, not as temporary guests, but as permanent settlements. And that is, to my mind, the challenge of human solidarity beyond immediate kinship. Thank you. Thank you. And now, Mrs. Gorel Turden, you take us to lunch, I think so. <laughs> yes. I want to connect to what Mr. Tandon said, because when he was talking about his own childhood, I was thinking of my little grandchild that is now uh, living in such a, a, a, a neighborhood with caring people, with possibility to help. And I think the aim of the forum must be how to give our children homes, health, and a future in peace. Other goals are of less importance. Human solidarity, exactly as you said, Frederick uh, Mayer, must be learned. But how would it be possible for a child uh, without home, without parents, uh, without health, with violence, with war, to learn about anything close to human, human solidarity. I think human solidarity today is a question of leadership, of a leadership based on ethics, spiritual values, and courage. What is more important than a safe and sound home for anyone? Homes that express not, that are not only houses, but express social solidarity, express acceptance of diversity, tolerance, and peace. Because without clean water, without clean air, uh, without healthy human settlements, without, without a decent living, we will have no peace. And that was really the aim of the Rio conference, talking about sustainable development, because that means harmony and peace. Habitat 2 is therefore the biggest peace project we ever had. And this And this project must be based on the Agenda 21 from the Rio conference, because that was the first UN document dealing with implementation and participation. Every time we meet, we talk about poverty, poverty we talk about uh, violence. What, what uh, do those words mean? Well, Poverty comes out from lack of clean water, lack of clean air, lack of food, healthy settlements and homes, lack of decent livings, lack of democracy, lack of justice. And violence comes out from exactly the same lack of space and lack of, uh, and uh, from stress, disparity, and no democracy, and what, what you can really range it. So that is why the Habitat 2 is the biggest peace project. And um, it deals really with the implementation to make a reality of decent living for everyone in the world. And um, we have also to remember it is not enough with commitments. It is not enough with legislations. 
we have to deal with people's access to different things, access to decent living. We shouldn't talk about commitments without using the political will to make reality of them. And uh, political will must be based on ethics. And I think we need a lot of courage today, a lot of leadership with courage based on ethics and spiritual values. And um, it must be based on people's experiences. It must be based on individuals. And we need visions. Someone was talking about making pictures out of what do, they, what do people really want to have in their cities? What do, you want, what do they want to have in their neighborhood? That is what matters, and that is uh, how uh, people can really feel solidarity when they feel they have the possibility to influence, influence their own life. I love a, a, an African proverb. It says, it takes a village to raise a child. That means uh, a child needs everybody to be raised in humanity and to be raised for human solidarity. And it takes every village, it takes the whole society, the whole world to really raise the peace. The UN system cannot do it. The European Union cannot do it. GUT cannot do it. It is us, every one of us, that must take part locally as well as globally. <laughs> Finally, I agree with Phyllis Lambert. Uh, we need democratic processes where we put in knowledge, where we put in experiences and scientific proofs, proofs, and where women and men, where young people and old people can take part in the discussions. So the right priorities will be made, for example, in the physical planning process. Because for me, physical planning is a democratic process where everybody is involved to tell what they want. Uh, what um, priorities they want to have in the end. Uh, so political will must be a force for a better world and political will must be focused on humankind instead of power kind. Thank you. Thank you uh, very much. <clears throat> I just um, have a couple of little announcements regarding uh, the lunch break. We will reconvene at 2.30, and then we will begin the discussion that arises out of these statements. Um, would the members of the panel just stay here for one minute uh, for a photograph? There is lunch provided, um, uh, I'm, I've been asked to say, barbecue at the Bosporus for your lunch and pleasure, and that is on the Café Sarre Terrace. You have to pay for it. It's 750,000 lira, which sounds like the World Bank figures to me, but it, um, <laughs> and, and there are other restaurants in the hotel if you choose to, um, if you choose to patronize those. Anyway, please be back at 2.30 and we will commence the discussion. Thank you. <laughs>